Good morning, and welcome to the Northwest Memphis Church here at Reflection Ridge. Um, we have uh, one announcement uh, before we get started in our call to worship, and that is giving. If you want to give, there are offering plates in the back. You can also give online at northwestmc.org slash give, um, and we give out of the abundance of what God has blessed us with. So if you want to give to support the ministry, those are the ways that you can do that here. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 138, 6 through 8. It says, for, the Lord is, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you persevere me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. We're excited that you decided to join us here this morning. Lydia is going to be leading us in worship this morning. So glad to see you all here. And go ahead and feel free to stand and to join us. Um, Gabe is singing at a wedding, wedding I believe, today. So he cannot be here. So I am going to be leading. And thank you all for joining us in singing and giving praise to our great God.
seated. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you that we are able to worship together in this space. We thank you that you brought us here. We ask that you be with those who are in the midst of change, in the midst of uh, changes in, in their life, we are present. We ask that you be with those who are suffering from illness or other affliction, that you would be present, your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for these things in your name. Amen. We're going to have our children's moment. Um, and so we're going to have the kids come down, and those who are kid-like in nature, um, including myself. Walk, walk, walk. It's a great, great thing when your dad has a microphone. <laughs> Thank you for today. Thank you for 
the story that we have to hear. Thank you for showing us that we can be patient and that you will provide for us even when it's hard. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning. It's great to have you join us this morning. We're continuing in our series through Exodus, uh, and we're going to be going over a large section of the text, um, covering Exodus chapters 5 through 14. Um, last week we talked about how the, the book of Exodus is largely split into two main sections, uh, 1 through 15, and then 16 through 40. Um, and so... You may be thinking, why have we just gone through the entire story of the movie Prince of Egypt in two Sundays? Um, I, we have watched it probably ten times in the last like month, I would say. <laughs> um, it's a regular occurrence in our house. The girl that's for the Moses movie. Um, and so uh, we, there is a reason for that. Exodus as a narrative is a bit front-loaded. A lot happens in less than half of the book, and the second half of the book is mostly about Moses and the Israelites wandering in the desert, listening to God, and then not listening to God. And so I want to make sure that we spend a good portion of our time covering probably the more complicated parts of the scripture. Um, and so Exodus 16 through 40 has a lot going on in it, and I think it's important to cover those chapters carefully. Sometimes we don't look at those chapters as closely as we do um, other chapters in the Bible. And sometimes, um, if you've ever done like a reading, when I was a teenager, I was, you know, in youth group, I was told that I had to do a reading through the Bible in a year sort of thing. And I got to basically this point in Exodus, and I was like, man, it's really hard after this, the narrative of like them leaving Egypt. Like it gets uh, complicated. Um, and so we want to cover those chapters carefully because there is a lot of depth. There's a lot happening in the back half of Exodus that is important to go over. Um, and so this morning, we're going to be looking at two uh, main pieces of text um, from the Exodus 5 through 14. Um, the first section of text is going to be 5, 19 through 7, 13. Um, that piece of text is, is really important for us to focus on. Um, and then the second section of text is Exodus 12. Um, and so before we dive into those texts, we've been trying, I've been trying to give a brief overview of what's been happening um, over those chapters. And since we're covering about nine chapters today, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of an overview that we need to do. Um, and so we left off last week in, in Moses being commissioned by God to go back to, to Egypt and free the Israelites. Um, and so this is where the story picks up. Moses returns. He meets with Pharaoh, asks for his people to let go. Pharaoh says more, and then he demands more work from them. And so Moses gets discouraged, and he complains to God. God then reassures Moses. Aaron and Moses go back to Pharaoh and ask again. Um, Pharaoh asks for a, a proof that, that God is with them. Moses throws down Aaron's staff. It turns into a snake. And yet Pharaoh still refuses. We then get to the ten plagues. Uh, blood, frogs, gnats, flies, livestock dying, boils, hail and thunder, darkness, and then the tenth plague of the firstborns being killed. We then have the Passover, and finally the Israelites are released. Pharaoh changes his mind. He attempts to recapture them. And this is the parting of uh, the, the Reed Sea, and the Israelites finally uh, being free from their, their oppression. Um, and one of the things, I just said the Reed Sea, I just want to, to, as a side note, there's been a lot of conversation about how that should be translated in the in Bible, and so the version we're using is C, the CEB version, and those translators think that it should be Reed versus Red. Um, so there's there's a little bit, uh, just so you understand where that came from. Um, so the first section of text we're going to focus on is 522 through 713. Um, and this is the story of Moses being discouraged after he has gone to Pharaoh. 
Um, and so it starts in 522. It says, Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, My Lord, why have you abused this people? Why did you send me for this? Ever since I first came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has abused this people. And you've done absolutely nothing to rescue your people. The Lord, uh, this is then now into uh, 6, 1 through 13. It says, Then the Lord replied to Moses, Now you will see what I'll do to Pharaoh. In fact, he'll be so eager to let them go that he'll drive them out of his land by force. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But I didn't reveal myself to them by my name, the Lord. I also set up my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as immigrants. I've also heard the cry of the Greek of Israelites, who the Egyptians have turned into slaves, and I've remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I'll bring you out from the Egyptian forced labor. I'll rescue you from your slavery to them. I'll set you free with great power and momentous events of justice. I'll take you as my people, and I'll be your God. You will know that I, the Lord, am your God, who has freed you from Egyptian forced labor. I'll bring you into the land that I promised to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you as your possession. I am the Lord. Moses told this to the Israelites, but they didn't listen to Moses because of their complete exhaustion and their hard labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh, Egypt's king, to let the Israelites let out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, The Israelites haven't even listened to me. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen to me? Especially since I'm not a very good speaker. Nevertheless, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, Egypt's king, giving them the orders to let the Israelites go from the land of Egypt. And then I'm going to skip ahead to 628. At the time, the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, and the Lord said to him, I am the Lord, tell Pharaoh, Egypt's king, everything I have said to you. But Moses replied to the Lord, Look, I'm not a very good speaker. How is Pharaoh ever going to listen to me? The Lord said to Moses, See, I made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You will say everything that I command you, and your brother Aaron will tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites out of his land. But I'll make Pharaoh stubborn, and I'll perform many of my signs and amazing acts in the, in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh refuses to listen to you, then I'll act against Egypt, and I'll bring my people, the Israelites, of the land, of the land, out of the land of Egypt in military formation by momentous events of justice. The Egyptians will come to know that I am Lord when I act against them, Egypt, and bring the Israelites out from among them. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. This section of Moses' story, I think it's interesting to me. Um, because I relate to it at this point. Which one of us hasn't been certain that God has told us something, and we've started following through on it, only for it to change, or our situation changes, and we can't pursue what we thought God was calling to us. Or we thought God was surely going to make a way for us, yet here we are, broken and disappointed, asking God why. Moses' setbacks could have ended the story in that moment. But Exodus could have been a lot shorter, only, only about six chapters. Where Moses goes, I don't get why you're doing this, God. I'm just, I could go back to Midian. It's better back there. Um, and yet, uh, we continue in the story. Moses' uh, setbacks are similar to Jesus in the garden from Luke uh, 22, 41 through 44. It says, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed. He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not my will, but your will must be done. Then the heavenly angel appeared to him and strengthened him. He was in anguish and prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. In Moses' moment and Jesus' moment of questioning, God comes and gives encouragement to those who are unsure and have doubts about the path forward. Right? Moses has made this incredible journey, and here he is, unsure on what God is asking him to do, because he realizes that if he doesn't get it done, things will, things will get worse. Right? They already have one request, and instantly Pharaoh makes it harder for them to meet their brick quotas. The good news of this moment is when we are unsure about our calling, and if, uh, is that we can rest, our faith can rest on God's determination to do His will. We don't have to work, carry the work of God on our own. 
He sends Aaron to aid Moses. He sends an angel to strengthen Jesus in the garden. Over and over again, when God's people are facing insurmountable tasks to make God's justice happen, he sends encouragement. God makes it clear to Moses that he is going to free the Israelites, and he is going to work through him to free his people. The reassurance that we have from this story is that if God is going to do something, he is faithful to his promises. He is steadfast and a loving God who does not shy away from what he promises, particularly when it comes to his justice. The other piece of this text in this section reminds us that it's not about us individually, right? Sometimes we like to make it all about us. Not only does God encourage Moses, but he reminds him that there is a list of people he has been promising things to, and that we can't think of ourselves on the individual level, but the corporate level, right? God in that story reminds Moses, your father Abraham, your father Isaac, your father Jacob. He's calling back to the history of what God has done over and over again. Um, the, the God Almighty in that passage where it says, um, go and tell, uh, sorry, uh, I am the Lord, I, I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. Uh, that God Almighty is El Shaddai um, in, the, in the Hebrew, and it, it means something particular uh, for the people. It's the name that God has been given to the ancestors to know that he is their God. Uh, and so the story isn't just about Moses. Moses is the one God has chosen to speak, so that he can then speak to his people. Moses is simply the conduit, and the reason God is speaking through him is because of his relationships to the tribe of Israel. Right? This, the reason God is choosing Moses is that he is connected intimately to the people of Israel. This should be relieving for all of us. The promise of Jesus' kingdom does not rely only on you, the only way the kingdom of Jesus is going to happen is if you see yourself as part of the family of Jesus who inhabits the kingdom. The other part of uh, this section I, I, kind of, I skipped over is that there's a genealogy. Um, there's a genealogy of the families that uh, Moses and Aaron come from, and uh, particularly Aaron's family. Um, and it's something that we need to remind ourselves in our journey together as people of faith, is that there, there is, we need to take time to encourage one another. Right? There, are, there, are the, there are these people who have gone with us on this journey, who are part of our family, and Moses is being reminded of this. And yet it's not just about him, but it's also that he has now an encourager. Aaron is now this source of encouragement who goes with him to Pharaoh. The opposition that we face to the message of God that he is a freeing and liberating God is a, is a direct challenge to the systems of power and darkness of this world. If we do not take the time to remind people that they are valued and worth, um, worth and worthwhile, that they will not be effective in their mission following God's calling. The work of Jesus is long, hard work, and we need to be encouraging to each other that the work is worth it. That your story matters in the larger story of what God is doing, and that what you would do here will echo into eternity. And justice in heaven makes justice here possible. And so we have this moment of encouragement for Moses, where he is reminded that there is a family along with him on this journey. Uh, the second part of the text that I want to look at more in depth is the Passover instructions. Um, if, if you think of this section of a uh, movie or um, this is a, a bit of a long-winded monologue or would be a montage, there's a lot of things that God tells Moses to do to make sure that the death of the firstborns passes over the Israelites. Um, 
and we're going to read a, a, a bit from those certain sections, and I'm sorry, it's, it's going to be a little bit longer. Um, there's just a lot here uh, in, in this text. Uh, and so 12, uh, 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you. To the whole Israelite community, on the tenth day of this month, they must take a lamb for, for each household, a lamb per house. If a household is too small for a lamb, you should share one with a neighbor nearby. You should divide the lamb in proportion to the number of people who will be eating it. Your lamb should be a flawless year-old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You should keep close watch over it until the 14th day of this month. At twilight on that day, the whole assembled Israel community should slaughter their lambs. They should take some of the blood and smear it on the two doorposts and on the beam over the door of the houses which they are eating. That same night, they should eat the meat roasted over the fire. They should eat it along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its heads, legs, and internal organs. Don't let any of it remain until morning and burn any of it left over in the morning. This is how you should eat it. You should be dressed with your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. You should eat the meal in a hurry. It is the Passover of the Lord. I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I'll strike, strike down every oldest child in the land of Egypt, both human and animals. I'll impose judgments on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be your sign on the house where you live. Whenever I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No plague will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Um, yeah. So this is Exodus 12, 1 through 13. Um, the next section that I want to read is, um, uh, can you go to the next slide, Jade? Um, so then this is, uh, later on, it says, in, in, this is verse 21, Then Moses called together all of Israel's elders and said to them, Go pick out one of the flock for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the bowl, and touch the beam above the door and the door, two doorposts with the blood in the bowl. None of you should go out of, your, out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord comes by to strike down the Egyptians and sees the blood on the beam above the door and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door. He won't let the destroyer enter your house to strike you down. You should observe this, as, this ritual as a regulation for all time for you and your children. When you enter the land that the Lord has promised to give you, be sure that you observe this ritual. And when your children ask you, what does this ritual mean to you? You will say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For the Lord passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. When he struck down the Egyptians, he spared our houses. The people then bowed down and worship. The Israelites went and did exactly what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron to do. Passover is um, a, sacred, a sacred ritual for those who follow Judaism. It signifies an important moment in the Israelite Jewish history, and it is done uh, specifically in certain times to re-engage the covenant God has given his people. Passover for us as Christians is, in some ways, not for us. Jesus, in his ministry, changes the meaning and purpose of things. It is on Passover when Jesus is arrested, he is celebrating Passover, but he institutes a new thing for us. Communion is our Passover, right? Blood for blood. It was blood on the doors, posts, and beam that served as, as the means of saving. It is the blood of the cross that serves as our salvation. We don't need to look at Passover as our event, when our Passover lamb is provided in Jesus, and he tells us how to remember his sacrifice. The Israelites, you'll see, as, as, if you notice in the beginning of this section in, verse, in chapter 12, is that what the Lord says is that he starts the new year. The new year starts with the beginning of Passover. Ten days from the beginning of this new year, this new month, you're supposed to celebrate, you're supposed to begin the work of, of Passover. Right? And so, for 400 years, the Israelites have been in bondage and slavery, and the memory of what the tribes of Jacob were like 
400 years ago is very, very thin. And so this Passover and then the festival of unleavened bread are signifiers and reminders for the Israelites of what God has done so they do not forget the power of their God. And so when we decide to separate the God of history from the God of today, we might end up in that same position where we forget what Jesus has done for us. All of these festivals and celebrations within Jewish customs serve as a communal memory of what God has done for the Jewish people. What God ultimately does here in, in this particular passage is that he provides a way for the people who follow God to be saved from the darkness and powers that, that exist in the world, that will seek to do unjust and immoral things. God has heard the call of those who have been oppressed, and he seeks to end it. Passover has a specific purpose for this moment in Exodus, and then it will serve as a reminder of the power of God throughout history and throughout um, Israel's history. And so it's unique for their, their calling. Um, I, um, I think that it's a very important thing to kind of separate out sometimes these two things, and that it is certainly Passover which Jesus celebrates, but Jesus institutes a new thing in that night and provides us with a way to remember his sacrifice. Right? The, the thing, the, the plagues, all nine of the plagues do not need a signifier up until the tenth. God knows who the Israelites are. He doesn't cover in darkness over Goshen, where the Israelites live. He doesn't cause hail and thunder over Goshen, where the Israelites live. He knows where they live. The blood is a signifier, a symbol of what God is willing to do. And the commitment that the people of God are going to make to this God. And so Israel uses then Passover at significant rebirth moments. The anniversary of the Exodus, uh, following the transference of glory from Sinai to the tabernacle, they celebrate Passover. At Israel's entry into the Promised Land, they celebrate Passover. At Hezekiah's restoration of worship in Judah, they celebrate Passover. Josiah's religious reforms, they celebrate Passover. And then the return from Babylonian exile, they celebrate Passover. Passover. It's a, uh, a yearly thing that is supposed to be done, but it is also done in specific moments. There are specific times when Israel says, this is a new moment for our community, a new moment for God's people, and we're going to remind ourselves of what God has done in the past and what he will do in the future. Um, and so these, these are directly linked to the history and the, and the, the fleeing, the oppression in Egypt. Communion can serve as that same reminder for us, just as baptism does. These are rituals and moments that we have decided as a church to celebrate. One is the remembrance of Christ, of his work on the cross and the power of his blood and the breaking of his body. The second is joining the family of God through water. These moments serve as guideposts. Every, for the most part, every Christian group throughout history has followed Jesus' words of remembrance. We may disagree on what it means <laughs> and what the specifics are, but we all use it as a remembrance point. When you take communion, you are joining a long chain of, chain of witnesses to the power of his blood for deliverance, healing and righting the wrongs of sins. And in baptism, you join a family who has been put to death and risen to life and has a new identity in Christ. These are things to celebrate on their own. I don't think we need to celebrate Passover because we have a new covenant, a new blood that heals and changes our lives for the better. If anything, we need to put more emphasis on the remembrance of Communion, the remembrance of baptism. Um, I think these serve as important reminders of what our community has done. That we have followed uh, 
uh, our own Passover lamb, right? Jesus has, some, there are specific prophecies and specific things that Jesus has, right? The body is not broken of Jesus. Um, he is taken down off the cross before his legs are broken. That's one of the important things in the cross. Um, and so in John, in John's gospel, he lines up perfectly when like most likely the Passover lambs are being slaughtered as to Jesus' death. There's specific reasons he's doing that theologically. And so what we have as a reminder of this moment of Exodus is that this is where it all starts. The symbols, the origins of what we believe start here in Exodus because of what God has done. That God is a faithful and steadfast God who calls us out of oppression and slavery and delivers us into new land. For us, as followers of Jesus, that means that Jesus serves as that land who serves as a gateway into a new identity, a new land. And so I don't think that when we look at, when we read this story, when we read through Exodus and we're reading through, and we're going to get into a lot more rituals and a lot more uh, things that the tabernacle has to be set up in a certain way, and there's uh, things that have to be made out of gold and bronze, and there's all these sort of particular things. And they serve, they are important for us understanding the importance of what Christ has done. But we do not need to go back to Passover to have a reminder of God's salvation. We have salvation through the cross. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you that you serve as an encourager, that you provide salvation to us. We ask that you remind us that you are doing, that you have called people to your justice, and that you encourage those who are following your paths. You encourage them through others, you encourage them through the word, you encourage them through song. Your encouragement is found in many places. We're also reminded that you are a saving God. You saved the Israelites from the slavery of Egypt. You have saved us from the slavery of our sins. As so we ask that you continue to remind us of that and that we remember the sacrifice that it took. That Christ is our reminder. And Christ is our Passover lamb. In your name we pray.
Our benediction verse comes from 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. It says, Live in this way, knowing that you are not liberated by perishable things, like silver or gold from the empty lifestyle you inherited from your ancestors. Instead, you were liberated by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a flawless, spotless lamb. Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you that you save us, that your blood saves us. We thank you for these things. We ask that you remind us of that this week as we serve to do your will. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your week, or beginning of your week, really. Um, <laughs> see you next Sunday.